So let's come to indications and technical aspect of posterior C1C2 fusion, right? We all know this, so I'll just, you know, just to complete the list, this is mobile atlantic axial dislocation, we all know this. We must also be aware of the fact that sometimes with osodentoidium, there's a retrolysis of the os. And this means that you have to position this patient in a neutral position. Can be put in a flex position or an extended position. He has to be in an absolutely neutral position. You have to make sure about this. And every os you must consider as, as being hypermobile. Then fixed, of course, uh, whenever you're doing transoral or something. And when you look at a very interesting thing, I'll tell you. We actually saw this. This was published in JNS a long time ago that they're, they're, they're completely different entities. Mobile dislocation and fixed dislocations are completely different entities. And you can actually make this out by doing by a study of the facet joints. Mobile dislocations will always have symmetrical facet joints. And fixed atlantoaxial dislocation will always have asymmetrical facet joints. Always there will be fusion, there will be occipitalization of atlas, C23 fusion, asymmetrical joints. They are completely different entities. I think mobile dislocations are because of ligamentous laxity and fixed dislocations are actually because of bony asymmetry at the facet level. Right? So they are completely different entities. And then, of course, carry malformation. One small point is that every carry malformation that you see, please do a dynamic flexion extension study. Look for atlantoaxial dislocation. A lot of times, I have got so many patients in whom <coughs> somebody has done a posterior decompression and has not done uh, and not looked at the atlantoaxial dislocation. And later on, they come back with severe myelopathy and progressive quadriparesis. Right, so you must always look for atlantoaxial dislocation. If there is atlantoaxial dislocation. Don't forget about carry malformation. Address the anterior aspect. If it's a mobile dislocation, address the anterior aspect by doing a posterior fusion with reduced atlantoaxial dislocation. If it is a fixed one, then do a transoral surgery or whatever, or even a distraction, whatever you want to do. But you must make sure that the anterior compression is relieved. Forget about carry, right? And then sometimes, you know, with severe torticollis, you might need to stabilize these and lots of problems. And then, of course, basal invagination, I think you know about this uh, classification where basal invagination is divided into two groups. One is where there is a straight central invagination, right? And there's another group which is basal impression, where what is happening is that if you look at all the conventional lines, the odontoid is not higher than the macrase line, which is from the anterior margin of the foramen magnum to the posterior margin of the foramen magnum. And yet there is basal invagination with severe cervical medullary kink because of platybasia and the whole um, uh, foramen magnum, actually bony part of the foramen magnum actually invaginating inside. So you must be aware of these two entities and uh, treat them accordingly. It's just a small thing. And of course, uh, any transoral surgery, you need posterior stabilization. And of course, all types of odontoid fractures, uh, when you have these odontoid fractures, you have to again stabilize. So I'm just telling you the indications for posterior stabilization. And then we have uh, tuberculous, rheumatoid, and uh, one small thing about rheumatoid arthritis. This was uh, during my Commonwealth Fellowship, I worked on rheumatoid arthritis. And this was published in Neurosurgery. And we found that uh, whenever we've done a small segment fixation for rheumatoid arthritis, it has never worked. It has always failed. So if you have a patient rheumatoid arthritis with atlantoaxial dislocation, and we are getting more and more patients like this, please do a complete long segment fixation. At least two levels above and one, two levels below. Otherwise, this is going to fail. Right? So, of course, we all know about how we plan dynamic x-rays, but one important thing is CT angio now we do for every patient. Every patient we do a CT angio, and now we are picking up more and more patients where vertebral artery can get injured. So, you must make sure that you preoperatively assess the vertebral artery and make sure that there is no injury to the vertebral artery, right, during surgery. And I'll tell you what are the variations that you are likely to get. So, look, coming to C1, C2 fusion, we have this classical subliminal fusion. Everybody's done it. This worked wonderfully well in children. I mean, I would still recommend them for children. Whenever you have a very young child, lateral mass and all that is a big mess, it's very simple to just do a subliminal C1, C2 fusion. So, what are the advantages? One important thing when you're doing this fusion is that atlantoaxial dislocation has to be in reduced position. So, how do you know it's in reduced position? You can use a C arm, but then it's very difficult. The only thing is, if you are passing a subliminal wires and you find that there's not adequate space there, there's not adequate space there, the joint is in dislocated position. It has to have adequate space. 
सो इफ द ड्यूरा इज गेटिंग कंप्रेस देर इज गो वेरी स्लो गो वेरी स्लो डोंट ट्राई टू मैनिपुलेट जस्ट गो वेरी स्लो इफ देर इज नॉट एडिकुएट स्पेस दैट मीन्स इट्स इन डिसलोकेटेड पोजिशन यू मस्ट मेक श्योर दैट दिस इज डन एंड द अदर थिंग इज वन इम्पॉर्टेंट थिंग विच मोस्ट पीपल डोंट एम्फोसाइज इज दैट वेन यू आर डूइंग अ सी वन सी टू फ्यूजन यू मस्ट बी प्रिपेयर टू चेंज पोजिशन ऑफ द पेशेंट चेंज पोजिशन ऑफ द पेशेंट इमीजिएटली extend the head a little you are not getting space extend the head a little as soon as you do that you will find that you are getting enough space right so be prepared to immediately manipulate the head a little come to the head on the table you don't have to you know re-sterilize anything you just with your drapes you just hold the head ask him to loosen it just extend a little you will start getting space there right small thing and then the very important thing is please estimate the c1 posterior arch and c2 laminar distance this is very very important but what happens is that if the distance between the c1 posterior arch and the c2 is too long then when you are putting those sublaminar wires the loop becomes longer the greater the distance the longer are the loops of the wires and which means that they will cause sublaminar compression so if you want a good fusion the c1 posterior a c1 posterior arch and c2 lamina have to be close together if they are not close together then the loop becomes long inside and that's where sublaminar compression comes in you know people don't think about these small things when they are actually doing it right then of course sometimes this there's a this is a big issue big issue what happens is that the movements of the neck are never in sagittal plane they are always coupled you understand they are always coupled every cervical every spine movement is coupled so one movement will be associated with another movement now what happens is that if there is a little torticollis which is very common in these conditions then you think that say for example i'll say this is c1 and this is c2 uh, i mean c1 anterior arch and this is posterior arch supposing so you think they're moving like this right they're moving like this or maybe uh, they're moving like this but they're not moving like this they're moving like this right so this moves like this in flexion and moves like this in extension now what happens is when you look at it in two dimensions you see that this appears to be close together see if you look at only two dimensions as soon as this become this appears to be in close together but actually they are not in close together so if you angulate it like that it appears as if they are close together and you think that th there has been a reduction but there has been no reduction what is happening is just that the plane has changed and you are seeing in two visualizing in two dimensions what is present in three dimensions are you understanding the second very important place where you think it's a mobile dislocation where actually it's a fixed dislocation and that second point is whenever there is an angulation any kind of torticollis when you are doing a ct sagittal reconstruction you are not actually getting the right plane in flexion extension once you are getting this plane and the second time you are getting another plane and at that point because the arch is like this here you are getting this plane in axial image and here you are getting this plane right so you think it is reducing but it's not reducing the planes are different in flexion extension simply because there is an angulation these things you don't look at so how do you get a very good idea that it's not in dislocation that it's not mobile you look at the joints if the joints are asymmetrical and you have a doubt about reduction right then there is no reduction number 1 the second is look at the posterior arch of c1 if the posterior arch of c1 is not well formed the joints are asymmetrical and you have a doubt about reducibility they are not reducible is that clear is that clear to everybody yeah so the problem with posterior wiring is that it's biomechanically very very weak and axial movements are specially not preventable right axial movements are specially not preventable this is very important point so when you look at the trans articular techniques it's very stable but with asymmetrical joints there is a risk of vertebral artery injury and if there is any cervical thoracic kyphosis very difficult to perform this and another problem is that redo insertion is very difficult so once you have decided a trajectory that's it it's fixed so it's like gone out of vogue not many <coughs> people are using it now so now we come to the technique which you can call as goels technique we or we like to call it goels technique but all europeans want to call it the hans technique <laughs> so what you do is you put a plate you put a plate or you can put polyaxial screws with a rod 
and one goes into C1 and the and so we focus on this because this is the one which is most adaptable and one which is most practical in the in today's circumstances I think. So it has very high fusion rates. It does not require a preoperative reduction. There is no sublaminar passing of wires anywhere, and you can put multiple trajectories of screws without any problem. And occipital C1 joint is not compromised. It's only C1 C2 joint which is there. There's a high margin of safety with any altered anatomy, some you know vertical joints and asymmetrical joints, and uh, it is easily integrated into longer occipital cervical construct. Say, for example, later on you want to revise it into an <gasps> occipital C3 C4. All you need to do is to remove the rod, put in more polyaxial screws, and then make it longer. So that that is why you know it is the most useful technique to work with. But of course, there are some contraindications. If there are fractures of the lateral mass of atlas in excess, the other thing is aberrant course of the vertebral artery. Sometimes what will happen is that the vertebral artery will not pass through the foramen transversarium of C1 and it angulates across the posterior, posterior uh, joint, C1, C2 facet joint. That's a very, very dangerous situation. You must make sure that you, that situation doesn't exist. The second is developmentally there is a first intersegmental artery. So rather than the vertebral artery, that artery exists, which you can actually see on an angiogram, CT angio, and you know that. The third problem is that there will be a very low-lying pica. A low-lying pica arising from the vertebral artery at the level of the foramen magnum. Careful, very, very careful. Just look at it. You must be aware of these things. If you are aware of these, you will not cause a vertebral artery injury. Right? And of course, if there is tuberculosis or rheumatoid erosions, that we want. So now, Nelson and Napoleon. Napoleon. <laughs> so coming back. So let's look at the anatomy. Right? So you have the anterior tubercle, the C1, right? And then you have the facets on this side. You see the angulation. You see the angulation. So now, where will you put the pedicle screws? You can only put it like this, right? There's no other place. You can even put bicortical screws. And what is the angle? Say about, say, how much? 5 to 10 degrees, right? So what is the thing? Just 5 to 10 degrees. And what is the best? On radiology, what is the best target to, to anterior tubercle? So the target is anterior tubercle going to the lateral masses, 5 to 10 degrees, and a little upwards, right? This will take you to the anterior tubercle. That's passing screws through C1. That's your trajectory of a pedicle screw. See, you will never injure the vertebral artery, which is lateral to you. Never, never. No question of injury of vertebral artery. Of course, you have to look at those variations, right? When you look at the posterior part, posterior part, you see that this is all you get. So this is the inferior articular process of the. This is all you get. So what you can do is you can also drill a little bit of the posterior arch here. It's very safe. When you're dissecting C1, just make sure that you're not dissecting along the superior border. Always, any time, if you ever do a C1, C2 fusion, there's no need to expose the upper margin of C1, right? If you stay here and below and expose C2 also, you will never injure the vertebral artery. So never go beyond the lateral margin of the lateral mass and the facets. Never go beyond the upper border of C1 arch, right? And just make sure your trajectory is proper, you will never injure the vertebral art, right? So this will be always lateral to you, foramen transfer area. Is that clear? Coming on to the C2, there is hardly any difference between pedicle and, you know, parse. So, so, I mean, if you ask me, what is pedicle and what is parse? So pedicle would be probably, probably, <laughs> I may be wrong, <laughs> but probably it will be this, this segment. And parse will be this segment, right? Now, the easiest to manage is parse. You can put in a long screw there, right? So therefore, the very simple technique is draw a line from the spinous process. Draw it like this, right through the midline. Draw a line along the parse through the midline, right? And that point of intersection is your point of entry. But it really doesn't matter. What matters is the direction. And how do you control the direction? Just look at the medial border. You can easily make, make out at the video. Just make sure where the lateral border is and just stay in the midline of the border. What is your angulation? As parallel to the parse as possible, right? Or you can be as parallel to the superior articular process as possible. 
So what will be the approximate direction? I won't say it is 40, but it's about between 20 and 25. So 20 and 25 medially, 20 and 25 medially, 20 up, right? And following the medial border of the parse or lateral border is difficult to follow because you have the vertebral artery right next to it. So just follow the medial border. This will just get you. Is that clear to everybody? You can put in a long screw, you can put in a 24 mm screw into it. No problem at all. Vertebral artery never gets injured because vertebral artery is always lateral to it. Right? Only thing is you have to make sure that you define the medial border and follow it along the angulation of the parse. Clear? Everybody can do that? Yeah. So therefore, what is the four-pronged <coughs> safety advice when you're doing a C2 fixation? One is medial border. Okay. Don't go medial to the medial border. Follow the... The second is lateral border. Don't <coughs> go lateral to the lateral border. Right? What is the third advice? Stay along the direction of the angulation along the parse. And the fourth is, you have a hint from the superior articular process of the C2. So the four prongs will get you very safe. I don't think any of us uses, uh, you know, this awl and tap and I think we just use a B1 cutter and just go like that. We don't actually, uh, never, we never use this awl and tap and rick. And even if you don't have a C arm, it doesn't really matter. Now, when you're distracting, this is a very important thing. One is that here, when you're following the parts, you will actually come to the, now distraction is another point which I thought I should mention. When you're following the parse, the best way to reach the joint here is to follow the parse. Just follow the medial border of the parse. Don't go to the lateral border. Just follow medial border of parse. Now you will get the C2 nerve root. Just cut the nerve root. I mean, there are several studies which show that it really doesn't make a difference. So just cut the nerve root. Don't think of retracting it up and down initially. Just cut it. Once you cut it, then you will see the facet joint clearly here. And having seen the facet joint, you can, you, it, it will, if there is dislocation, the facet joint will be already open. And this is known as the, I told you about the naked facet sign. So whenever there is dislocation, the facet joint is already open, right? You can actually see it open. And once you see it open, then all you need to do is to uh, put the dissector, a slightly wider dissector inside and rotate it like that. It will open up. All right? So it's, it's not a difficult thing at all. It's very simple. Only thing is just make sure that you don't go lateral to the lateral edge of this point. That's the only thing you need to look at. So I already told you about this, 5 to 10 degrees medially and about 20 to 20, 30 degrees upwards and medially, right? It will get you there, right? So these are uh, some, this is the way. And how much do you want to go? Go as much as you can. You can even take a bicortical purchase at C1, right? And even at C2, you can go anterior. There's no problem. 22, 24 mm, no problem, right? Here 16 to 18 mm, no problem, right? Just one or two points only about the occipital cervical fusion. So we have so many types of occipital cervical fusion. I won't get into all the details. You already know them. There's only one point that I like to mention. One is when you are actually doing an, this occipital cervical fusion by creating this artificial arch business. One important thing that you must remember in case you're doing it, that you must make sure that you must make sure that this C2 is close to the occiput again so that the loop is not too high. And the other very important thing is, please just remove the posterior margin of the foramen magnum. This is not mentioned, okay? But it's a practical point. If you don't remove it, then the loop of the wire goes inside. So just make sure that you are removing the foramen magnum so that this loop goes on moving distally from the cord. Just a small point that you, you need to look at. And when you are actually doing a contour rod, if you're doing a contour rod stabilization, supposing you don't have those rods, I mean, it's almost outdated now. But if you are doing it, please make sure that these rods, these, these screws are well tightened. Because what happens is that there is telescoping of the rod between the loops of the wires. So this is something that you really need to look at when you're doing a contour rod. This is the commonest complication which results in instability. The rods move back and forth between the, uh, the, the commonest problem. You understand this is something you need to do. And finally, the occipital <coughs> fixation. When you're doing an occipital fixation, then what happens is you must remember the anatomy of the occipital bone. There's an internal occipital crest, which is the thickest part. The problem is just below that is the occipital sinus. Just below that is the occipital sinus. And sometimes it's a very prominent sinus. 
then there is there may be a CSF leak. That's another problem. But you need a bicortical purchase here. Don't worry about bleeding from the occipital sinus. Don't worry about CSF leak. Here you need a bicortical purchase because a monocortical purchase will just come out. So here you do need a bicortical purchase and in the center where there is an internal occipital crest. Nowhere else is it stable. The only point where it is stable is the internal occipital crest. So even if there is a little bit of venous breathing, it will automatically stop when you <coughs> actually put the screws. Right? Is that clear? Now coming on to the subaxial spine from C3 to C6. Here it's a very interesting situation. The foramen transversarium has actually moved medially. Right? The foramen transversarium has moved medially. And this is pedicle is very small here. So what you what do you need? You need this for stabilization. So what you do, rather than going medially, C3 to 6 is, what you do is the same 5, 15 to 20 degrees upwards and laterally along the lamina. So stay along the lamina, 15 to 20 degrees upwards and this is your trajectory. You see the vertebral artery will never be injured by this, never. And it has to have a bicortical purchase. So C1, C2, medial and C3 to C6, lateral. Vertebral artery will never get injured. Right? Is that clear to everybody? So that's all. Thank you so much.